Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Good. Um, welcome to our talk by Dr. Ron Butler on lichens. I think this is going to be very interesting. I imagine, like me, a lot of you have seen them growing around and wondered. And I think they're, they're going to be, uh, we're going to learn a lot. I wanted to let you know we will have our spring series of talks starting in March. We're working on topics. We don't have anything definite. We're looking at some things about climate change and uh, various other things, but we will be starting those in March and you'll be getting information about that. Also wanted to say that we're looking for more people on the board. If any of you are interested, we'd be happy uh, to talk with you. It's not real demanding, but we could use some more help. And I guess that's all the housekeeping sort of things. And I'm going to let Ron just start uh, teaching us about those wonderful things that grow in our environment. Ron? Alrighty, you guys can all hear me, I hope. I'm gonna assume that's a yes. Um, I have to start in the spirit of full disclosure by confessing that I am not a lichen biologist. Um, those of you who are familiar with me uh, know that I spent the first half of my career studying seabirds uh, in Maine, Newfoundland, and Antarctica. And I've spent this second half of my career for about the last 25 years studying insects, predominantly damselflies and dragonflies, and a variety of native pollinators. So I've been associated with these three statewide citizen science initiatives. Um, I consider myself kind of a recreational lichenologist. Um, I was looking for something to do during the winter months when there are no birds or insects around, or very few. Um, and some friends introduced me to lichens. Um, and I was quickly, um, as I am drawn to all other taxonomic groups, uh, charmed by the immense diversity of lichens that you can find right in your backyard much less the entire state of Maine. So I uh, learned a lot from friends who were uh, much more knowledgeable about lichens than I am. I uh, spent a lot of time with the then um, paper copy of Jim and Pat Hines' uh, uh, Field Guide to Lichens and uh, Mason Hale's uh, How to Know the Lichens book. And um, I'm going to also point out that while some of the photos that I'll show you are my photos, others will be just taken from Wiki Commons. And what I'm just doing now is kind of trying to give you a feel for the diversity of lichens we have right here in Maine. And so when Nancy asked me to give this presentation, <clears throat> not being a lichen specialist, um, but having looked at lichens for about 25 years and, and had uh, students do research with lichens and so forth, I decided the presentation I would put together tonight would be one that um, assumes that you're a complete novice in terms of, of your understanding of lichen biology. So basically, I'm going to give you some lichen basics. I'm going to talk about lichen growth forms. I'm going to define what a lichen is three different times in this presentation, and you'll see why. I'll talk a little bit about lichen uh, reproduction, lichen diversity and rarity, lichen conservation, tools the amateur lichenologist should have, uh, a key to the the most important um, characteristics for lichen identification to get you started. And then I'll just go over briefly some lichen resources. So let's begin with some basic lichen factoids. 
First of all, first definition of what a lichen is. Lichens are simply fungi that have become lichenized. And I know that's not a terribly uh, descriptive um, definition of a lichen, but bear with me. So in terms of the evolution of lichens, it was long thought um, as they are primary colonists on newly exposed uh, landforms that lichens probably preceded um, terrestrial plants in terms of the uh, evolutionary sequence. But recent studies have now pretty much nailed down that lichens evolved after vascular plants, probably around 400 million years before present. Now, again, let's go back to my definition. Lichens are fungi that have become lichenized. So that presumes that, that fungi were around before lichens for first put in appearance. And the amber uh, uh, you see on the right side of the screen is a lichen from about somewhere in the vicinity of 25 to 35 million years ago. So, so they have a long fossil history. They don't fossilize very well, but when we get fossils, we, we're pretty good about dating. Another facet of lichen evolution is they don't all stem from a common ancestor. It looks like lichenization evolved in 10, at least 10, different fungal lineages. So in terms of uh, evolutionary biology, lichens per se are sort of a polyphyletic group. They have multiple origins. How many lichens do we have on the planet? Well, it depends on the source. You can find uh, estimates as low as about 13,000 to estimates of 18,000. There are probably more than that that are not discovered. If we consider North America, if we consult the most recent uh, lichen um, list for North America, I get 5,283 species. If we think about how many lichens are in Maine, well, if you look at the book by uh, Pat and Jim Hines, they have 461 documented species. More species may have been found since 2007. Uh, a paper by Seward in uh, uh, 2017 notes in various um, forays around Eagle Hill on the Down East Coast, at least 600 species. Uh, Bennett and Wetmore found 400 species in Acadia National Park alone. And the Heinz acknowledge that in addition to the macro lichens that they, and I'm not sure you see my cursor here. Do you see my cursor, uh, Nancy? Um, in addition to the macro lichens, they documented with the uh, additional micro lichens, possibly can, as many as 1,200. Go ahead. Ron, we can see your cursor. I had to get the... Okay, so you can see it right now. We all set? I'm trying to decide. So, Nancy, I just want to make sure I have it on the right screen for you guys. Can you see my cursor moving now? We could a moment ago. How about now? There it is. There it's back. Okay, now, now I just hit it. All right, I've got the right screen, so we're good. <clears throat> it's disappeared again. Oh no, there it is. <laughs> if I move it, it will reappear. Um, in terms of lichens prevalence on the planet, uh, the estimates in terms of the Earth's surface cover is seven to eight percent, and that may seem pretty high. I mean, if you look around Maine, do you see seven or eight percent of the state covered with lichens? But you have to remember that lichens are much more prevalent in some regions. So if we look at the boreal biome, the boreal forest biome, we find that 20% of that biome uh, by biomass is lichens and 95% of the ground cover. So, so they really are well represented beyond what you might expect looking around the state of Maine. Lichens uh, have very slow growth rates, some under a millimeter per year, some maybe as high as two millimeters a year. 
So that means if you look at a dinner plate size uh, or even a saucer sized lichen on the side of the tree, a tree, it may be older than you are. And in fact, the determination of lichen growth rates has led to the science of lichenometry, um, by which measuring the average size of lichens on a given rock face, uh, you can estimate when that rock face was first um, either cleaved off a larger rock or unburied or however it, it um, um, came to be exposed. So what's the role of lichens on the planet? Well, they have an extraordinarily long list of ecosystem services. They are, as I've already alluded to, primary colonists, a new landform, new soils, new rock faces. Lichens are usually the first things to colonize. They carry on photosynthesis, so they're involved in the carbon cycle. They're important uh, in terms of soil formation. Uh, in arid regions, the kind of biocrusts that lichens and bacteria form help uh, reduce soil erosion due to wind and or water. Some lichens, because they contain uh, cyanobacteria, are involved in nitrogen fixation. Lichens are what we call poikilohydric organisms. They can't regulate their water balance, unlike you. So a lichen is sort of like a sponge. You dump water on it. The tissues fill up with water, and then the water slowly evaporates. And the fact that the water slowly evaporates from the lichen means that lichens that are up in the canopy of trees help moderate the humidity within the canopy. Lichens are food for a vast variety of vertebrate and invertebrates, including humans, by the way. Uh, reindeer, deer, caribou, uh, flying squirrels, a uh, number of kinds of invertebrates, uh, 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 snails, slugs, lots of things eat lichens. Lichens uh, are also used as nest material uh, uh, by our own flying squirrels in the state of Maine, but also in a variety of bird nests. Now, this is not a Maine, a Maine bird, but you can see the lichens here in the in the um, outer wall of the, uh, of the um, bird's nest. Lichens can also be used for cam camouflage. Now, that may be why these birds include these lichens, but other animals really regard uh, lichens as very important in terms of cam uh, uh, camouflage. And the peppered moth is one of those. And the peppered moth is not the black moth that you see, that's the black morph of the peppered moth. The moth is actually right there. And you can see how it that crypticity the moth has evolved really matches the lichens. In fact, that's the whole story behind industrial melanism that you may be familiar with. Um, as the Industrial Revolution took a hold in Europe, particularly in Britain, uh, there were lots of particulates and sulfur dioxide put in the air, and some lichens are very susceptible to that, and lichens died off in Britain. And as a result, the crypticity of the normal peppered moth, uh, moth morph was no longer an advantage, rather the dark morph had the advantage. And sure enough, if we look at collections from those age, you can see that the peppered morph disappears gradually or, or is greatly reduced, and the collections contain more and more of the, of the, um, of the uh, black morph because, um, uh, and again, and, and predation may also have, have entered in here too, but predation was probably picking off these guys, bird predators, and, and mostly these guys were available. As air quality improved in Great Britain and behind the improvements in air quality, lichens slowly started regenerating. Guess what? This form bounces back again and starts supplanting this form because now there are lichens for that crypticity to work. So camouflage. And finally, habitat. Lots of little things live in and on um, lichens, including uh, uh, some micro insects, protozoans, and notably tardigrades and nematodes. You can go off to almost any tree around you, peel some lichens off, put it in spring water for 24 hours, and you will find these critters. Right? 
So again, a, a pretty impressive list of ecosystem services. What about humans and lichens? Well, there are a number of cultures who use lichens in food, as food or as beverage. Uh, lichens have been used as diapers and uh, actual clothing. People actually weave things out of some of the of the uh, um, fruticose, fiber, fruticose lichens. Um, you can find all sorts of books on lichen dyes. Uh, lichens are used, some lichens are used in perfume manufacture, uh, folk medicines. A recent paper found 52 genera of lichens are used by various cultures around the world. And almost every culture has some medicinal or multiple medicinal roles for lichens from everything for headaches to vision problems and gastrointestinal issues and heart problems and and uh, cancer and you can you name it you can find some culture that believes some particular lichen is good for that particular ailment in fact uh there is lots of medical interest in lichens because lichens produce uh, more than 800 very unique substances and some of those substances have very potent antibacterial, antifungal, or antiviral properties. Some of them have insecticidal or anti-protozoan uh, properties. Uh, there's some interest in some of these substances in terms of their anti-inflammatory and possible anti-cancer uh, application. So, so there's there's some real uh, substance to these folk uses of lichens in terms of some of these unique uh, substances produced by lichens, mostly uh, as secondary metabolites. Again, from our perspective, lichens are used as ecological indicators. Uh, air quality is one of those. A study that uh, was very uh, uh, much talked about in the late '90s was an Italian study. Um, that showed this remarkable link in Italy between lichen diversity, very high in the north and declining as you go south, with cancer mortality, very low in the north, increasingly high as you go south. So there's a correlation between high cancer mortality and low lichen diversity, which has nothing directly to do with lichens but everything to do with the quality of the air that's producing the higher cancer mortality. Uh, because lichens act like sponges, you throw a sponge in the dirty dishwasher after you do the, the, the dirty dish pan after you do the dishes, and you put it on the shelf and you don't wring it out, the water evaporates, but anything that was in the dishwasher is still in the sponge. That's the same thing with lichens. So they will absorb any number of air pollutants, including aerosolized heavy metals and unfortunately radionuclides. After the Chernobyl incident, the uh, radioactive material that was put into the atmosphere was absorbed by um, many lichens in Scandinavia. And as a result, uh, the Laplanders had to slaughter many of the uh, uh, reindeer uh, herds because they had been consuming radioactive lichens. And the federal US federal government has had a program since 1990 called the Forest Health Monitoring Program. And that's a program uh, that takes place nationwide. There are, there are plots all throughout the United States, and those plots are monitored every year. So that's just your feel for the Northeast, where some of these plots are, including plots in Maine. And while they're looking at all sorts of parameters having to do with the health of forests, one of the things they're also monitoring are lichens. And so that's been going on for quite a while, and there's a quite a distinct positive relationship with um, air pollution related to lichens in terms of nitrogen and sulfur and the percent of those pollutants that are found in lichen tissues. So it's again, a very potent uh, indicator of, of air quality. Um, one of the oldest creatures on the planet right now may in fact be a lichen. Um, 
Rhizocarpum geographicum, the map lichen is a very common lichen. We find that in Maine. Anytime you go uh, any place where the rock surfaces have been exposed for some time, particularly above tree line, you'll find this one. It's this really bright lime green. Uh, this is not the particular lichen, but there's one of these lichens that's been dated at over 8,000 years of age. Lichens can get quite long. Uh, this species uh, used to be known as Usnea longissima. It's now Dulico Usnea longissima. Methuselah's beard has been measured at being more than 20 feet. And we have um, a number of species of Usnea in the state. And you, and you can see this kind of filamentous thing, particularly around um, evergreens, uh, particularly once you get up in the mountains. So where do lichens grow? What are their substrate characteristics? Well, you pick a surface and we can probably find lichens that grow there. There are lichens that grow on tree bark. There are lichens that grow on rock surfaces. There are lichens that only grow on dead wood. Uh, lichens that grow on soil. Lichens that grow on building materials. Uh, lichens that grow in fresh water. Lichens that grow in seawater. Lichens that will colonize rubber and glass and metal. Lichens that will even colonize the leaves of some perennial species. And it, normally, groups of lichens tend to grow on a single substrate. So there's a, there's a host of species that tend to grow only on trees, but there are some species that cross boundaries. So you can find some species that grow on trees that will also grow on rock. You can find some of the things that grow on rock that will also uh, um, colonize uh, synthetic materials. This is actually lichen growing on a whale skull. Lichens are extremophiles. They're global colonists of almost any surface. They are resistant to heat, cold, and drought. And I'll come back to why that is. So the lichens on the left are growing on a rock surface uh, 50 miles outside of Las Vegas in the desert. Picture on the right I took uh, during my first uh, research tour in Antarctica. That's the Ross Ice Shelf. And you can see the lichens that have colonized this bare, uh, rocky substrate near the shoreline. Lichens have even gone to space. We find that uh, the European Space Agency's uh, Photon M2 mission actually took two different species of lichen into space. Uh, again, Rhizocarpin and Xanthoria, this orange lichen. Um, when in space, they had the lichens affixed in a canister on the outside of the vessel. They opened it up to hard vacuum and radiation for 15 days of the mission. They then sealed it back up so the lichens wouldn't be harmed during reentry. And when they got them back to Earth, the lichens were fine and continued metabolizing normally. That's the definition of extremophile. So when we talk about a lichen, and this is a very common lichen uh, in, in this area in Maine, we talk about the body as being the thallus. So anytime you use that term, that's what I'm, that's what I'm referring to. We talk about in certain lichens, these little um, lobe-like things as well, lobes, okay? So, in this growth form that looks like a leaf, we'll always have lobes associated with the thallus. So when we think about growth forms of lichens, we generally recognize three or four, although in some sources you'll find they break the, further subdivide them into uh, six or seven. I'm just gonna stick with the four. The first group are the ones that are leaf-like, called folios lichens and all these are common in, in Maine. The second form is shrub-like, and these are the fruticose lichens. The third form are characterized usually by these very upright stalks bearing fruiting bodies, and they're actually characterized by the thallus, which is down here, and they're, they're called, and I'm gonna just uh, show you a, a blow up of this. These are called squamules. 
So the thallus is actually composed of these squamules. They're attached at one end and the other end of each squamule is free and they don't get much bigger than this. So these are therefore the squamulose lichens. All right, so the foliose lichens, the fruticlose lichens and the squamulose lichens together represent what we call macro lichens. The micro lichens are represented by crustose lichens. And crustose lichens basically have a thallus that's difficult to resolve. I mean, this is the thallus, but it looks like it's spray painted on this limb. These things are smorgon structures. Same here. You can see the thallus, but it looks like it's just spray painted on the bark. And again, these are spore bearing structure. And this, you don't see any reproductive structures, it just looks like a spray paint spot. This one, you can sort of see some structure. This is um, um, Debias, it's a, a pink lichen that's very easy to spot as you're driving along the road, especially if it's been wet. Again, here's the thallus of this crustose lichen, this is a soy lichen, and again, some rock dwelling lichens. But again, you know, you can't, you can't, unlike the folios like it, you, you have to, if you want to collect these, you need a, a hammer and a rock chisel. All right, so my second definition of what lichens are. Well, I told you that they were fungi that had become lichenized. Well, what does that actually mean? Well, as it turns out, a lichen is a fungus and algae or cyanobacteria, or what we used to call blue-green algae, symbiote. It's more than one organism. So when we look at a common foliose lichen here, what we'll find is a fungal cortex, very densely back, uh, packed um, mycelia, a loose medulla area. You can see the, the fungal hyphae very clearly, a layer of algae, kind of the way you would expect a leaf structure to look. And then a lower cortex of very dense uh, fungal strands and maybe some structures underneath and we'll come back to those. So a lichen is not a single organism, it's a composite organism. And as it turns out, about 20,000 species and growing of fungi can be involved in these relationships. They're what we call a mycobiont. And 90% of these are from one group, uh, the ascomycetes or the ascomycota, the sac fungi. And 2% uh, other fungi like uh, the uh, city wings. In terms of the algae uh, or cyanobacteria, there are now a hundred known species that may be involved. 90% of lichens have algae, about 10% have blue-green algae or what really are bacteria, cyanobacteria. And there are some species, including here in Maine, that have both. So what's the nature of this unique symbiosis? Is it a mutualism? Uh, is it a commensalism? Is it a parasitism? You can find some arguments in the literature for any one of those things. But what we do know is this, what the mycobiont provides for the photobiont is shelter, water and inorganic nutrients, protection from intense ultraviolet radiation, and protection from predators and pathogens. So that's what the algae or cyanobacteria get out of the relationship. What does the fungus get out? Well, the fungus gets sugar alcohols produced during photosynthesis that leak out of the cell walls of the algae or glucose directly if it has a relationship with cyanobacteria. So is this a true um, mutualism. They each get something out of it. We could argue that, but in some lichens, uh, they actually penetrate the photobiont cells with these uh, protrusions called haustaria, and they quickly kill the cell 
as a result. In fact, some lichens kill the cells almost as fast as they can reproduce. That doesn't sound like a mutualism. That sounds more like a controlled parasitism of some kind. So it probably depends on the lichen that we're talking about. And I've represented the, the, the situation here as if it's quite simple, a kind of quid pro quo, right? But it's actually much more complex than that. So not only do we have you know, CO2, water, and light going to the, the alga and sugar alcohol is going to the fungus, we've got metabolites in the fungus that are influencing synthesis inside of the algal cell. And uh, substances produced by the algal cell that are influencing the production of lichen compounds in the lichens and the fungus uh, metabolism. So it's an actually a quite complex relationship. And the more we study uh, um, genomics, the more complex this relationship becomes. Another aspect of lichens is uh, the concept of morphogenesis. So a lichen species is actually named after the primary fungus that makes up the thallus. But as it turns out, the symbionts look entirely different if they're isolated from one another. So here's a species of usnea, and this is a typical usnea form. But if you culture the primary fungus and the primary algae in this structure, it looks like this and this. Neither of them take the form of the actual symbiotic organism, and they won't until they're together again. In fact, some of the fungi that are found in lichens are not found in the wild without lichens. It may be they cannot survive without lichens. Excuse me, without algae. Again, this is very common. You've probably all seen these things called British shoulders, right? I, I will point out that there are a half a dozen species in Maine that will produce these same red uh, soldiers, so the different species. But this is a, a very uh, common one, Cladonia cristatella. And again, if you separate these guys in culture, the fungus looks like this, kind of a bunch of wad of white fungal hyphae. And the alga, Trevoxia, which is, is one of the most common photobionts uh, amongst lichens, looks like that, kind of a, a green slime. It's only when you put the two together that you get the magical morphogenesis of this creature. So I'm going to try for a third time to define what lichens really are. And there's been a coming realization in the last decade that lichens are really ecosystems. That uh, not just one fungus, but multiple fungi may be involved in a particular lichen phallus. Um, there are a number of fungi that are lichen, excuse me, lichenicolous. They live on or in other lichens. There may be multiple species of photobionts in the same lichen phallus. There may be multiple and are multiple bacterial symbionts, yeast symbionts, and viral symbionts. So what's that mean? It means that if you go out and look at a particular species of lichen and do a DNA analysis on all the critters that live in this system, you may find that one lichen of the same species does not have the same DNA profile of another because there are different fungi, different bacteria, different photobionts, different yeasts inhabiting that particular thallus. So the flexibility of symbiont makeup in a lichen can mean there is a lot of diversity in terms of genotypes of a particular species of lichen out there, that populations of lichens may be quite different from one another, depending upon which symbionts they happen to carry, and that the communities of lichens from place to place may be very different, even if they have exactly 
exactly the same species. And it's this flexibility in terms of the makeup of this composite organism, this composite system, which may spell the key to lichen success, why it is they can occupy the most extreme environments, ranging from the poles to the you know, hottest deserts. Lichen reproduction is complex. First of all, lichens can reproduce vegetatively, and they can do that in three different ways. First of all, pieces of lichen can simply break off fragmentation blow with the wind, get carried in squirrel fur, and find some suitable substrate and start growing again. That's pretty cut and dry. Or lichens may produce one of two additional structures. Ceridia are balls of uh, fungal hyphae with some photobionts in them. These things get released, blow with the wind, get carried by water, get carried by animals, settle someplace, and this can now, because it's got both the mycobiont and the photobiont, produce new lichen. Or they may produce these structures called isidia. Now, isidia differ from ceridia in that they have a layer of fungal cortex around. But basically, we still got the fungus and the algae together. This goes someplace, settles in an appropriate habitat, boom, sprouts a lichen. So the key here is both the fungus and the photobiont disperse together. But lichens may also show sexual or asexual reproduction. So apothecia and parathecia are sexual spore forming um, structures. Um, pycnidia are asexual spore forming structures. So this is a typical Apothecia, and the, in the apothecia, you can see these tiny little sac-like structures that are called ASCII, and those ASCII have spores. Right? A parathecia also has ASCII, but a parathecium, instead of being on the outside of the lichen, is actually embedded in the lichen, and all you really see is this top part. But again, it can release these spores. The problem is this these spores do not have the photobiont. It's just the fungus. So when these spores emerge and fungal hyphae start to emerge from them, in order for the lichen to form, that fungus has to acquire a photobiont. Otherwise, there is no lichen as a result. So here they go with the photobiont. Here the fungus has to reacquire a photobiont. And it's actually even more complicated than I've represented here. How about diversity of lichens? Um, for those of you not familiar with it, um, North America can be divided up into ecoregions. These are regions that are similar in terms of climate and soil geology and you know, uh, plant, uh, often plant uh, uh, communities and so forth. Different ecoregional schemes get defined different ways. This is the one that uh, was formed as the result of NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Act, where Mexico, the US and Canada agreed that they would uh, convene a panel of scientists and geologists together and develop a unified eco-regional scheme for North America. And this is the, the level one scheme. Uh, they progressed to level two, level three, level four, where they increasingly subdivide small areas. And you can see right now, Maine is split between two of these eco-regions. On a study done this year, or published this year, uh, people looked at um, uh, herbarium collections to determine what the diversity of these various ecoregions was in terms of lichen species. So I'll just point out that Maine lies in the northern forest and the east temperate forest ecoregion. And you can see the highest number of lichen species is, boom, in part of Maine. 1,694. Uh, this one is not far behind. This is the third lowest, 1,118. So, so Maine has a rich uh, looking for uh, compared to some other areas like uh, this, this uh, eco-region, the Great Plains eco-region. But look at this. 
On this side, we have a like and rarity index. And what this, these numbers mean is the average number of other ecoregions that have these lichen species in them. So each lichen species in an ecoregion, how many other ecoregions does it sit in? Tally up all those, get the average, and the average value uh, for the most diverse ecoregion is also one of the lowest. So many of the lichens that exist in our ecoregion are rare. The rarest, of course, is down here in the wet tropical forest in southern Florida. So that allowed these authors to say most lichens are rare. So how about New England? Um, I'm going to take all of this from uh, Heinz and Heinz, 2007. They found that 56% of New, Eng New England lichens are rare or in decline. 16 species have disappeared from New England since the early 1900s. And as they weren't, they haven't been found since. Now, I, I will point out that absence of proof is not proof of absence. But when lots of people are looking for something that are skilled and knowledgeable and can't find it, that's a pretty good indicator. It's probably gone. 39 species have disappeared from at least three New England states. And most of those species are either very sensitive to air pollution or, and or, are old growth forest specialists. The good news is of these 39, 36 are still found in Maine, including this pseudocyphal area crocata, a really startling uh, gold and brown lichen. And that may mean Maine is sort of a refuge being one of the most forest, well, the most forested state in the Union by land area, and maybe having better air quality than other New England states. Like in conservation issues, air pollution, uh, these three big players, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, and ammonia are um, um, really uh, uh, bad news for many lichens. You can see lichens in general will increase with increasing nitrogen concentration and sensitive lichen species dramatically so. Uh, photochemicals, that is chemicals formed in the atmosphere secondarily by the action of ultraviolet radiation on various uh, primary pollutants in terms of ozone, uh, pans, or aldehydes. Uh, pans are perioxyl nitrates. Uh, heavy metals, and again, lots of heavy metals get aerolyzed. All of these things tend to reduce lichen metabolism, they can reduce growth, they can reduce survival importantly, and they can reduce species diversity. Land use changes, suburbanization and agriculture lead to habitat fragmentation. And habitat fragmentation uh, often changes critical light temperature and moisture regimes, which reduces survival of lichens, but can also reduce reproduction because they become dispersal barriers. You end up with islands of a suitable habitat for some lichens. A number of studies have shown that intensive forest management also reduces lichen diversity because it reduces habitat complexity and habitat continuity. And finally, in some, uh, some areas, the in introduction of invasive plant species, um, rhododendron, for example, um, ends up swamping some forests and reduces habitat complexity for lichens, which reduces like in diversity. And the final big one, of course, is climate change, as it is uh, affecting so many other systems on the planet. Uh, climate warming is changing temperature and moisture regimes, and for some lichens, that's uh, a death knell. Um, a recent study has shown that the rates of photosymbiont evolution uh, in uh, algae, in particular, and particularly the most prevalent algae, Trevoxia, is really slow. Trevoxia, based on genomics, appears to only have adapted um, for every increase in uh, temperature by one degree centigrade over about a million years. So the symbiotes, the, the, the fungi may be okay, but the photosymbionts may not be. 
Um, another recent study, 2016, showed that uh, a 93% distributional loss in high altitude lichens with warming. So these are the Appalachians, a hot spot for lichen diversity. And this is the projection. The, the orange shows the, the, the prevalence of, of like high lichen diversity. You can see by 2050 what's projected and by 2070. Same people looked at sea re level rise along the mid-Atlantic coast. These red areas are very high areas of lichen diversity. And these areas are going to be the first that are inundated by increasing uh, uh, sea levels that are a, a logical consequence of global warming and the melting of the polar ice caps. In terms of lichen conservation, uh, the IUCN, International Union for uh, Conservation of Nature, already has red listed 590 uh, species, 279 of which are in the US, two of which are in Maine. Uh, the federal government has two species on the US endangered list the Florida perforate uh, Cladonia and the rock gnome lichen. Uh, uh, in Maine, uh, by the way, these are not in Maine, neither one. Uh, we have none on the Maine list. So if you want to look at lichens, what do you need? You need something to magnify with. Um, there are lots of lenses out there. I have an embarrassing number of them. Um, I know you can go out and buy a $6 plastic one. I would advise against it. Spend 20 bucks at least and get something that's halfway decent. I would advise nothing more than 15, at least 10 magnification, probably not more than 15. The focal distance gets too short. You have to get right on top of the lichen. So 14, 15, 16, about high as you want to go, right? Um, many of them now come with a light, which is very useful, especially get really close to something. Um, you can spend well over a hundreds on Iwamoto's. They have fabulous optics. I'm not sure that they're worth it. I have one. I am embarrassed to say I do, but, um, I, 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 I tend to use my, my Bausch and Lomb Hastings or, or a cheapie with a light more than anything else. Um, you can use a camera, camera magnifiers on your phone, right? So here's a Leica and I took the other day, just to show you the size of it. And that's what I do with my camera magnifier and phone. And yeah, I can see some structures there. I can see these reticulations and I can see the presence of these ceridia and so forth, right? Um, but in fact, uh, and phone cameras are getting better and better. It's no question about it. A, a, a really cheap pocket point and shoot camera will probably have a macro feature on it. And they do a much better job at this. You can really see the structures much more clearly here when I use my little pocket camera on a macro setting. And you can usually blow these up so you can really see some, some detail. If you're gonna collect lichens, and I don't anymore, uh, or pretty much I don't, uh, it's just a pocket knife and these simple uh, paper squares or paper bags um, is all you need, okay? If I wanted to collect a lichen like this, I would not just carve off the entire thing I would take a small representative piece. This critter may be, you know, 15 years old, right? Um, but you have to look at it carefully. So if you look at this lichen, you'll see here's some very smooth lobes, but here's some lobes that seem to have some structures on them and the structures are critical for identification. So look at the entire thallus, make sure you get a portion of it that has structures on it if you're gonna take it. Um, there are some chemical tests that you can do that further help you identify uh, oven cleaner provides the, the material for one, Clorox bleach the material for the other. So it's really simple, low tech stuff. Fallen branches are great. I went out this morning, found some branches that came down the wind off my crab apple and immediately found eight species of lichen on that little branch. So there's one, uh, two, three, there's a crustose lichen there. This nice orange Xanthoria just starting out there, although it's already got a fruiting body. This and this are the same thing. That's something different. This is something different. This brown one is different than this brown one. 
Okay, there's, there's tons of diversity right in your own backyard. So depending on how you're going to approach what you do need as a guide. And if you want to study lichens in, in Maine or New England in general, this is the book. Okay. Um, do not order it on Amazon.com. They list it for about four times its price that you can buy it from the New York Botanical Garden Shop. And, and I think it's about $65, but it's way over 100 on Amazon. Uh, Pat Hines took most of his, Pat and Jim Hines, Pat Hines took almost all the photos and they're all beautiful. The, the keys are very easy to follow. And if you don't want to buy the book right away, you just want to try it out. Their key is free. You can get basically all the keys they have, the 2013 edition, at this website and download it as a PDF. And what I'm going to do is walk you very quickly through what you need to know to use the key. Because what they do is they start out with this really simple um, index. And it relies on these eight characters. The substrate, whether it's on trees, rocks, or soil. It's growth form. We already covered what growth forms were, right? The color, the lobe size. And remember, these are the lobes, right? And it should be greater than five millimeters or less than five millimeters. And I just want to point out that you can see the lobes very easily on this thing. And this is about as big as uh, your palm. Can you see the lobes on this little yellow one? It has lobes too, but they're obviously very much under five millimeters. And then the presence of one of these four structures. And as soon as you decide what your lichen has, say it's this one, they will refer you to the page where the keys get more complicated so you can actually get down to species. So I'm just going to spend a little time on the first one, the color, because uh, I always, when I first started out, I found this one very confusing, mineral gray. Well, mineral gray covers lots of ground. For me, it covered, you know, they were talking about greens. They're calling mineral gray. And, you know, some things do look mineral gray, right? But that doesn't like that, that much. To me. So, so mineral gray is kind of a fuzzy characteristic. Uh, yellow, green, and yellow are pretty straightforward. Orange, everybody's got that, right? Brown to uh, brownish gray, greenish brown, pretty straightforward. And grays, dark brown, black, pretty straightforward. Um, I will point out that uh, lichens can differ in their apparent color based on whether they're wet or dry or whether they've grown directly in the sun or more shaded. And what the Heinz have done is, if this lichen can appear in more than one color chart, they've listed it both places. So you won't, you know, you don't have to get the specific color of what they've said the lichen was. You can kind of go by the, the color that the lichen is when you look at it. So if you look at a lichen, you only need to kind of check out these characteristics in the field. What color is the upper cortex? What color is the lower cortex? It's always going to be different. It's either going to be white or gray or brown or black for most lichen species that have a lower cortex. What color is the medulla? Remember, the medulla is the inner layer. So I always have to kind of scrape a little piece off and break it. And I did on this one. And you can see that while most lichens have kind of a gray-white medulla, this one is orange. And that's diagnostic in this area for this particular species. The other structures, you have to look at the whole thallus because the structures won't necessarily be on every lobe. Some lobes are quite smooth. Some lobes clearly got things going on here, right? So you have to examine the whole thing. You have to look for Isidia. And we talked about Isidia. You can see them here, and I blew them up here. Okay, so these are these look like finger-like projections. They look like this. They may be simple or they may be coralline with branches. But again, that's diagnostic. And where they're located is diagnostic, but all you need to know is it's got Isidia to get to the right key. Do they have Ceridia? And I, you know, I find the distance, the difference between, let me go back a bit. Notice that these look like little projections. These do not, right? I, I always think they look to me like heads of broccoli or something, or, 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 or 
cauliflower or something like that. And that's because they're not covered with uh, uh, cortex. And they may be individual or they may exist in clumps that are called sorelium, singular sorelia plural. And again, where they are can be diagnostic. But all you need to know for the, the initial identification, does it have does it have acidia? Does it have does it have both? Some species do. Does it have these little crevices that are called reticulations that allow air into the medulla to the uh, uh, photobiont layer? Does it have pseudocyphelae? These are like reticulations, except they're pits. They're not crevices. Does it have what looks like powdered sugar? especially on the distal uh, ends of the lobes. Those are called pruina uh, and, and very diagnostic for a couple of species of lichen. Does it have root-like structures called rhizemes? They can be simple, they can be complex with cross branches, they can be the same color as the lower cortex, they can be a different color. Those are all diagnostic. Rhizemes help the, uh, particularly the uh, lichens that uh, it, uh, are colonized trees to hold on. Does it have cilia? Now, cilia kind of look like rhizines, except they come out from the periphery of the thallus, not from underneath it. And they may be the same color as the, as the, as the lobes themselves. Does it have apothecia, these cup-like spore-forming structures? And they can be different colors, they can be the same color as lichen or different colors than lichen. And again, they can be arranged differently. They can have other structures associated with them. Does it have pycnidia? Remember said pycnidia were kind of like parathesia. All you can really see is the opening, but they look like little ink dots. Let me blow that up a little more. On those lichens, they're pretty regular little blood, um, patches. So again, you see this part. Here's the spore forming structure in the thallus itself. In at least one group of lichens, these things actually protrude out from the edge of the lobe. These are uh, what we call pycnidial projections. And finally, does it have podicia, these very upright structures? So you learn those simple characteristics and you're ready to go. You can Determine if your lichen has any of those or none of them. Find what corresponds to that particular choice. Go to that page and it will start you on the key to identifying your particular species. Now, if you get the book, you've got images to go by. If you get this, just this, you'll have no images. And I'll, and I'll fix that in just a minute. I do want to acquaint you with um, this book. This book is kind of like a Bible of Lichens for North America. It's by Ernie Brodo and the Sharnoffs, published in 2001. I took two week-long intensive courses with Ernie. Um, he's kind of like the Gandalf of North American lichenology. Um, but this one has 1,500 species, and Ernie just published an update of just the keys in 2016. So it has more species than the hind, but species across all of North America. Um, and Great photographs by Sylvia Sharnoff and includes the crusto species, which, which uh, the Heinz book doesn't. Again, if I were going to do lichens in Maine, I would get the Heinz book. It's wonderful. I know there's some other guides out there. I have Ralph Pope's. This is a great little guide if you're going up above tree line on a hike. That's where he specialized. I don't know much about these two. Um, this one, again, if you're going to buy it, uh, I think it's about $38 at the uh, New York Botanical Garden shop. If you go online and try to buy it, it's like $138. So um, I, I would go there if, you, if you're interested in that. It will have many fewer lichens than the Heinz book does. You want pictures of the lichen you observe, you identify the Heinz guy. There are a bunch of websites you can, you can play with. Uh, Discover Life has one. If you ever use these keys, you kind of choose, okay, my thing looks like this. You choose that. And it, and it starts narrowing the list of things, uh, choices that you have to, to go. So it goes right through characteristics and it's a, a very user-friendly guide. Uh, you can get the free Seek app for either iPhone or Android. 
So I had a picture of this lichen on my screen and I took my phone and sure enough, they got it right, Parmelia sulcata. Um, I don't think it's very good with lichen, seek is getting better and better. The artificial intelligence thing, but lichens can be hard without additional tests that aren't readily apparent, additional characteristics that are not readily apparent from a simple image for many lichen species. And it can only look at what it can see. It can't, for example, tell you from this image what the lower cortex looks like, what color is it? Well, seek can't see that because you didn't make it clear. Now I could have like, flip back one of these and then taking the picture, but they did. You can go on iNaturalist and do a search for Maine. I just did common lichens of New England. And you can see that there are 124 species that have been reported on um, iNaturalist since the, the uh, program came online in 2011. There are other lichen websites. The USDA runs one. The Sharnoffs have uh, their own website, beautiful photographs. The North American Lichen Herbaria Consortium has her lichen portal. Here you sort of have to know the genus you're after to actually start searching species, but you may well know that from the, from the Heinz uh, field guide. And what you can do is take a short course. Gary, Gary Perlmutter is going to be doing one the end of November online at Introduction to Lichens at Eagle Hill. Um, these courses are very rewarding, uh, they're usually five nights, two hours a night. Um, to, to be honest, I'm supposed to be in one right now. It's the last night of my spider course. Um, I love these kinds of course. You get an expert up there. He dumps a whole bunch of knowledge that takes years and years for you to acquire. and You get it all like in a short period of time. So again, you can go, if you're interested in this course, you can go to the Eagle Hill uh, website and um, see if that's something you want to take. So at this point, I think I'm out of time and I'm happy to answer questions, but there, uh, there are so many lichens right around your own house out there. This is an easy thing to get hooked on. You can do it by photography. You can do it by taking small samples and taking them home and looking at if you've got a digital microscope. And that's what I use now, just a cheap little digital microscope, um, you know, a hand lens. It's, it's, a, it's a great way to keep yourself busy during the winter months when biological diversity seems to decline here. This picture I took just yesterday morning, right outside the education center at UMF. Uh, Kinniwatha Park is a great place to go. A bunch of those trees have been there for a long time. They're large, they've been exposed with lots of light. I took generations of students there to study lichens, lots of diversity, both on the trees themselves and on the rocks that are exposed. So um, lots and lots of opportunities out there to, to get involved with lichens and lots of species. Um, to investigate. So um, at that point, um, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to uh, entertain them. Thank you. That was uh, incredible information that I think people are maybe feeling overwhelmed with. I'm not sure. Are there any questions? No, I think you've maybe answered all the questions. It's a, it's a yeah, I have to say that there's a lot of information uh, packed in here. It's kind of, I wish I had had this lecture when I first started. Um, it would have given me a much clearer path to walk. But I will say that uh, much more is known about the complexity of lichens today than when I first started looking at, at looking at them 25 years or so ago. Um, and, and that's again through modern molecular techniques to study of genomics that we're, we're understanding just how complex these little critters that one person described to me once is, well, I think that's just, those are just like scabs on the tree, it's diseased. Um, yeah, not quite, but yeah. um, uh, again, fascinating, fascinating organisms. Yes, we have one question. Okay. How 
How, how many different what? Oh, things. I didn't, didn't quite get that. So her question is, there's the fungi. Um, the algae. So can there be more than one type of algae and more than one type of fungus? Well, that's growing, that's growing together. That's, that's what that's what the new genomics say. There, that the, the, a given lichen species has probably got most of the fungus in it is of one species, but that we're now finding there are multiple species of fungus in a single thallus. There may be multiple species of photobionts in the same lichen thallus. Now, often it's most one, uh, but it's not always the same one as was long thought. So it was long thought that, well, if a lichen forms a symbiotic relationship with say the the algae traboxia that's the only one it forms with well no that apparently is not the case and it apparently lichens can actually change the photobiont if they emerge from a spore or if they emerge from an isidia let's say with the photobiont they left the parent thallus with and they acquire a new photobiont do they a new species? Do they keep both? Does one replace the other? Uh, apparently, either one of those things can happen. So apparently, there's quite a bit of flexibility in a particular lichen species in terms of the makeup of which fungal components are there, which uh, photobiont components, which bacterial components, which yeast components, and so on. So it's it's a it's a really kind of flexible composite organism that we treat as if it's an animal or a plant or a mushroom when it's not. Thank you. Any other questions? Looks like that's it. Thank you very much, Ron, for a fascinating talk. Appreciate your agreeing to do well, this. Yeah, again, I, I, I apologize for not being a like an expert. Um, I just kind of shared with you what I've learned over the years. Um, um, I, 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 again, consider myself a like an hobbyist and apologize to any real like an experts out there who happen to be in the audience. Okay. Well, thanks again. Surely. Applause, applause from the audience for you. Well, thank you very much. Good night. Good night, all. <laughs>